Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can I welcome you to the uh, the ninth uh, of the uh, Friday afternoon LTT online discussions? Um, I know there's a few familiar faces here today who've been with us for a lot of the others. Um, we've set them up to bring people together to discuss current issues online rather than at our seminars and events. And um, we've, we've covered a huge amount of territory. But up to now, we haven't looked in detail at the implications of the pandemic uh, on the um, professional landscape in terms of uh, availability of jobs and opportunities for new entrants to the profession and their career development, etc. Um, I was in conversation with uh, Fred Ewing of Meridian um, recruitment consultant and we thought it was a good idea to have a conversation about what's going on out there and try and put some um, some structure to the future and even at the present time how many people are taking on or laying off staff uh, in, the, in the transport professional field. Um, so there's a panel today of five people to discuss that issue. We're really pleased to get perspectives from consultants, uh, professional associations uh, and uh, local authorities. Um, my job today is simply to welcome you and say um, this is the last one of our uh, online events uh, for a while because the summer break, uh, August, we think there probably won't be that much uh, attendance so we'll, we'll resume in September. So I'd just like to thank everybody who's helped with the first uh, eight and nine of these. Uh, in particular, Andrew, who's been an excellent host and is now a bit of a celeb presenter on, on telly. Um, so um, I'll just hand you over to Andrew to uh, steer us through the discussion. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, thanks very much, Peter. I was just reading uh, uh, something in the Times saying you can't be a celebrity or, and a journalist, you have to choose, and I would certainly choose to be a, a journalist. Um, but thanks for that. Uh, so the... the um, the topic for today is, uh, can we retain the transport planner's skills after the furlough? Um, a usual format, uh, we'll run to hopefully about 3.30 as long as the conversation continues. Um, if you're new to this in any way, then you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat facility, and I would urge you to um, write any thoughts um, on that chat. If you want to ask a question, write it out. I'll try and keep an eye on that um, to keep the conversation flowing. And so if someone's got, um, if someone's not on uh, mute, if they could put themselves on mute, I can hear something coming through at the moment. Uh, five panelists, uh, each speaking for about five minutes. I don't have much uh, of a kind of overview to give on this. I, I, I'm looking forward to this because I think I'll learn quite a lot. Um, one of the things of editing the magazine through furlough has been, or through COVID, has been just the enormous amount of um, new content we're covering. Uh, that there's no shortage for us, it's, it's non-stop. Uh, and really this morning, I've just been reflecting on what it's like for being in the profession at this time. Uh, so I'm looking forward to kind of add, uh, joining up a few kind of dots uh, in what we've covered. We've certainly covered things which might make one think that the profession, the future of the profession isn't great at the moment with home working for a lot of office workers, uh, local authority budget uh, under severe pressure, um, transport organisations such as Transport for London facing enormous budgetary problems and big projects as well, um, you know, long term big infrastructure projects, what's the future for them with demand changing. Um, I was particularly reminded by that by this morning reading the Department for Transport's new guidance on GDP for, for a project appraisal and um, based on the Office of Budgetary Responsibility forecasts. Um, they're saying that the, the GDP forecast for the next 50 years for appraisal is 23.7% lower than the previous um, version of the forecasts. And obviously that's got a huge impact for demand, uh, potentially travel demand. And also population forecasts are also being reduced quite significantly. So look, that's enough from me. Um, over to our speakers. And the first person I'd like to welcome is Fred Ewing. Managing Consultant uh, from Meridian Business Support, uh, their transport and infrastructure team. Over to you, Fred. Thank you, Peter. Um, 
can't hear you actually, Fred. You sound like a um, sound like a, a computerized mouse. <laughs> Do you want to have another go? No, it's still sounding strange. I don't know. It ranges from not being able to hear you at all to a kind of computerized voice generation. Just one second. That's it. You're back. Is that better? Yeah, that's much better. Excellent. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for having me on. Um, I think that this is really important. Uh, from where I sit, uh, in my role as a recruiter within transport planning specifically and all the various different elements of transport planning so modeling economics traffic engineering and um, highway design we have um, a sad but privileged view on how the market has been reacting to the pandemic um, and what various companies are doing and we're seeing that there is a continued push to realign uh, is what quite a lot of companies will be saying um, their workforce with regards to the amount of work that they're getting in so we've been speaking to all the consultancies most of the public sector organizations about what they're doing um, with regards to skills recruitment retention redundancy and so we have a fairly overarching view of what is happening uh, and I think that my viewpoint from that is that there are quite a lot, as opposed to what happened in 2008, where everyone went through exactly the same thing and the, and the funding tab got turned off. We see things quite differently um, in this current recession and pandemic. What we see is that there is no, that there is no underlying um, thought across the sector as to how people or businesses should react to the pandemic. Some businesses are doing really very well. Some businesses have been impacted horribly by things like Heathrow being put on hold or being cancelled. And so no two businesses are the same in the way in which they've reacted. However, we are seeing that quite a lot of those businesses that have been impacted are making those redundancies we are losing people uh, and those people that we see coming through to us tend to be those ones who are more gradual or, or younger in their profession and it's those ones that we really can't afford to lose in the same way that when we did lose them in 2008 and 2009 to other industries we found it impossible to, go, to get them back and five years down the line when everyone's, everyone's wanting senior and principal uh, transport planners they couldn't find them they were lost uh, and they've gone over to different industries. We can't have the same thing repeat itself. On the flip side of that, what we also notice is that the public sector is um, doing well. Well, not doing well, that's the wrong way to put it, but there is money in the public sector in certain schemes. There are big projects out there that are being run and there is a, a fairly optimistic um, view that the market is in nowhere near the state it was like within in 2008 and 2009. We've just run a survey, uh, which I think most of you will have been involved in or, or contributed to, so thank you for that. And we've not published that, the results of that yet, we're still collating the results, but the first thing that we noticed on that was that 50% of the respondents did say that within the next three months they expect to be at pre-COVID levels of work. That's fifth, so, and further to that, 68% have said that they're going to be at that level by the end of this year, which is massive. And obviously some companies who are involved in airport planning or, or say were heavily involved in Heathrow, they will never get back to that kind of level for some time. But the ones that aren't are genuinely optimistic. And what we don't want to happen is for these redundancies to occur for us to lose them to the industries like fintech or other technology-based um, uh, disciplines, only for the recruitment tap to come back on in, say, September, October, be it public or private sector, uh, and find out that those people have gone. Um, and that's, that's the risk we run. Um, I think finally, before I hand over to someone else, I think that what we see is that quite a lot of the people that are being married are almost exclusively coming out of the private sector. And we would hope and expect that because the funding and the money is there for quite a large amount of the projects, 
that the public sector can assist in bringing these skills back in and actually saving themselves money from having to go to perhaps uh, private sector consultancy for the support that they would normally have requested in better times. And I think that that's probably going to be something that we discuss further on in this conversation. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sure we'll come back to a lot of those points, Fred. All right, second up, uh, Stephen Bennett. Stephen is chair of the Transport Planning Society and a director in Arab's transport consulting team. Hi, hi everybody. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and yeah, I'm speaking mainly as chair of TPS, but also to draw on my experience in the private sector as a consultant. Um, and it is, apologies for any wind noise, but I've got windows open and a fan on to try to keep as cool as possible this afternoon. Um, yes, it's, it's really challenging times for the transport planning profession at, at the moment. We've had to deal with unprecedented change in the transport sector whilst dealing with major impacts to our profession. And it's a good point from Fred that, you know, ev everyone's impacted differently in, in different businesses and different sectors. Um, the local transport sector has been highly disrupted by the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Travel behaviour has been disrupted and changed. We've had massive reduction in public transport use. We've had more people working from home, people appreciating quieter streets and cleaner air from uh, reduced traffic levels, which has led to more active travel. Um, but there's also a number of threats. So, you know, the, the guidance to avoid public transport and potentially car use coming back quite strong uh, compared to public transport um, are challenges we've got to face. So there's general agreement. This is a huge opportunity for change for the better. Um, and to not return to business as usual, but to, you know, build back better, make this a, a green recovery. Um, and this has all had a big impact on, on the transport planning profession. Whilst we've been overwhelmed with these unprecedented changes in our marketplace, we've had to deal with significant changes in our own personal working situations. Um, so in, in local authorities, officers have been redeployed to COVID emergency roles or have had to rapidly process new guidance and advice from central government. In the private sector, consultants have had to cope with major reductions in some areas of work and had to adapt to a much more competitive market, um, although some areas of work have remained resilient. Um, but all this has led to major risks to jobs and to skills. Um, many of the larger consultancies have already made cuts to their workforce with many transport planners sadly losing their jobs recently. Others have elected to furlough transport planners through the government's coronavirus job retention scheme. But this is reducing its level of support and will close on at the end of October 2020 so we could see further cuts to come. And this is all against the background of the worst recession in living memory and the statistics are frightening. The, the, the period March to May this year saw GDP fall by 19%. Uh, business and consumer confidence has been dented, unemployment's rising despite furlough, and there's uncertainty about how, when the rest of the restrictions will be lifted. And the forecasts from OECD are that the economy will contract by 11, over 11%, um, and if we have another lockdown, it could be 14%. Um, in the previous recession, 2008-09, um, we lost skills in the profession as people diversified away from transport, as Fred has mentioned, and training ground to a halt, both the professional development scheme that we run and transport masters courses. And this had quite a time lag, so depths, the depths of the, the recession were actually about two, two to three years later, and then as the world recovered, there were shortages, as Fred, Fred talked about, about two to three years after that. So it's quite a long-term impact from these changes um, and a big risk to transport planning jobs and skills over a potentially long period. So it's a pretty, pretty grim outlook, but I, I, I do think but despite all of that, there is reason for optimism for the next generation of transport planners and their career prospects. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the pandemic has created an opportunity for transport planning, particularly around a sustainable recovery that gets us on the right trajectory for decarbonisation of the transport system to achieve the uh, legally binding target of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Um, and with the government likely to invest in transport infrastructure to stimulate the recovery and with its publication of bold ambitions for active travel this week, um, there is and will be a huge need for transport planners and transport planning skills. Some of this will be for our traditional skills in things like major scheme development, transport modelling, assessment appraisal and street design and planning for local transport. But we will need to develop skills in new areas um, and that's something we can we can talk about more today but it might be things like um, data analytics 
I've mentioned carbon assessments, need to understand carbon budgets at national and local levels, uh, engagement with local communities to deliver some of the active travel changes we want to see, and collaborating with other sectors such as spatial planning, education, and health to ensure we can meet net zero targets and reap the benefits of a healthier and more sustainable transport network. So I recognize a huge impact on our profession and many people will be feeling negative at the moment, but I do see the opportunity for transport planners and our skills being invaluable in future. And I think it'd be great to hear today from people where they are on that scale, you know, people feeling, feeling uh, positive or, or negative. So uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen. Right, uh, third up, Michelle Wood. Head of Technical Development at PTRC and the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. Over to you, Michelle. Michelle, you might be on uh, mute. I can't hear you. Right, I'm on. I'm mute. Okay. Thanks, every, uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, just so that I do not repeat or duplicate what uh, Fred and um, Steve has mentioned earlier, I agree with everything they said. But um, th there is, although there are budget cuts uh, in the various uh, projects that and people are being redeployed, there is great opportunity to feel um, in industry and the world albeit it may be moving from major projects to more local maintenance projects but the skills are still needed and i think uh, what should come in quite strongly is the uh, cohorts of uh, transport planning apprentices and i noticed caroline from tech who may may like to contribute something from it and paul Furman as well from the um leads Leeds College of uh, ed, uh, of Building, I think. Um, so, uh, any difficult questions like that, pass it on to them. <laughs> and I hope Caroline would uh, respond on that. <laughs> um, so, um, it, it, in terms of how it will affect us, because uh, PTRC, we deliver transport planning courses, uh, professional courses, and upskilling for uh, for the industry. Uh, we've noticed. Uh, quite a lot of the attendees are from local authorities uh, and we are busier than ever because we've managed to um, transfer all our courses online from the beginning of March. In fact, we are delivering a 10-day uh, road safety training in Hong Kong, but remotely because it was scheduled for February uh, it, for face-to-face, -face, but it never happened. We keep postponing it until finally we decide we're going to deliver online. So it's a 4.45 4 a.m. start for me on Monday. Um, it's a seven hour every day for the next 10 days. Um, so exciting. Um, so I, I think it's very important that we maintain, get, uh, maintain the training and the retraining, as we mentioned earlier, um, to make sure transport planners are still up there. Now, how um, there's I was thinking how we could retain the people, um, people that have been put on um, redundant furlough or and eventually through um, being made redundant, they could still come into the industry via as freelance or self-employed. And these people could come in uh, as their own self-employed people on zero hours. I think that's great opportunity, especially for the senior people will be able to roll it out on the, on the senior contract. Um, and in fact, I think looking at it, transport planning jobs are still there, especially with the sustainability agenda and a lot of the active modes, uh, last mile uh, projects are going to be kicking in, uh, especially in UK. And I think in, um, in France as well, the, um, the uh, fast track, the, the fast track of the city agendas um, means a lot of the respacing and realignment for to accommodate pedestrian and cyclists and also the e-mobility is still going to happen. Uh, so the skill set is still needed. Maybe the focus will be slightly changed. Uh, that still is still relevant. Um, I think most of the um, 
the meeting modes and training could still go ahead on uh, remote working. Um, we've noticed um, that Teams meeting have increased a thousand percent in March uh, 2020, this March. And the Zoom meetings from 10 million in end of last year to 300 million disabled. Uh, so the one issue could be we need to strengthen our technology and internet connections because um, Zoom especially takes a lot of uh, data and uh, imagery. Uh, and uh, with PTRC, we've now going to, we all have been working remote and we've taken the decision that from end of this year, when our office list expired, we're all going to work from home for the next year. Uh, so we, we're releasing that, that, uh, that, that property, but the, the impact, uh, the first impact on it will be lots of, um, lots of uh, property, office properties that's going to be uh, over surplus and the prices on it is going to drop. So I do not know what's going to happen to it. So yeah, so I, I think if we to take it forward, there's great opportunity as well as challenges. That's me done. Thanks, Michelle. That's an interesting flavour of events, uh, uh, things at PTRC. Um, Right, fourth up, uh, Tom Van Vuren, Technical Director of Consultant Mott McDonald. And Tom, I will tell everyone, you're now back in the UK after your trip to <laughs> Australia, because you're a bit concerned we don't know where you are in the world. Yep, I'm not, it's not the middle of the night. It's actually sunny in Herefordshire, so uh, yes, I'm back. Uh, and I've got an opinion as well, which will not surprise you. Um, I think the first point, I want to throw some... Um, a statistic at you as well. Um, this morning I got an email from Australia around um, the transport infrastructure sector and 80% um, of the business that had been uh, interviewed had um, had felt an impact on their business less than they had expected in in you know in uh, in March, February, March, but also 80% had uh, had experienced and would expect for the year 2020 a, a substantial financial hit. So I don't think that this is the end of the line for transport planning and transport planners and the talent that we're trying to keep. This will, there is a, there is a dip here. <clears throat> and as I think Fred always also said, there is an expectation in the market that the workload will not drop very far and also that it will pick up again. So it's important that we don't lose sight of, 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 of that and that the, um, yeah, that the uh, recession hopefully will not be as long and as, 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 as we experienced in 2010. Um, in that context, and also given the time that we've had during lockdown and, and furlough, I think for me it's very much about retraining rather than retaining. So it's for the whole of the profession to look at what, what skills do we really need um and um to what extent um do we have them and to what extent do we actually need to ensure that people will have those skills and those competencies that we need for the foreseeable future rather than looking back at what we what we needed in 2019 but i see there is adaptability of of our staff um resilience uh, not just in our staff, but also resilience as a topic that we need to be able to, to bring into our skill set and, of course, data science. Um, next point to make is there are winners and losers. Um, I think others have already mentioned that. So there are areas of, of, of transport planning where I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an excess demand and, and that goes back to the retraining rather than retaining and, and enabling people to, to, to continue to have a satisfying and meaningful career in transport planning. Um, Fred mentioned the public sector. Uh, yes, I can see that. I think a lot of the, the issues that we are seeing at the moment in transport planning are, are firmly sitting in the domain of the public sector, dealing with you know, um, tactical, um, tactical transport planning and infrastructure, uh, behavior change, uh, impacts on budgets, uh, public transport and its future role. Uh, and I hope that as a profession, that means that we won't lose all those people that at the moment are worried about their, their longer term career, that we won't lose them to other areas, that we can actually keep them employed 
in 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 the public sector rather than the private sector and uh, that's what we're talking about really um yeah you know, make sure that we don't lose um, the skills that we need in, uh, in 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 the future um final point um others have said it but i want to re repeat it i don't think that um there is uh, an end to the need for for good transport planning what we do is managing change so if there's ever a time in which change needs to happen is already happening and people have shown an appetite for that change it's now uh, it may be less about building but certainly changing the use of making better use of everything we've got that could be office space that could be uh, road space could be public transport and where i see that certainly happening and where i, I see a, a growth that's really exciting is, is in that integration of land use and transport planning um so i'm i'm pretty pretty positive thanks andrew I wouldn't expect you to be anything other than positive, Tom. Um, final speaker, Joe Thornton, team leader for highways development management at the university, uh, sorry, I was going to say the university, I meant to say the oh. Unitary Buckinghamshire <laughs> Council. That's one, Joe, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so for us as a public sector organisation, uh, we are hopeful that the recent situation with respect to COVID-19 will highlight the positives that working for a local authority can bring. Um, where we have previously struggled to recruit senior transport planners, for instance, we hope that transport professionals may now be encouraged to consider public sector work if they haven't already done so before. In a location such as ours in Buckinghamshire, where, for example, house prices are significantly above the national average and being within commuting distance of London, uh, where we have previously found it difficult to compete with the private sector in terms of salaries, we now have the potential to attract a different market than we did before. The COVID situation has demonstrated that geography has become less of an issue. And in terms of recruiting, we now have a potential pool of candidates far greater than ever before and working for the public sector may now be a more attractive option than traveling into the city for instance our team in uh, for our team the crisis has had somewhat of a galvanizing effect and we've certainly seen more collaborative working um, graduates have continued their master's degrees virtually and our apprentices have also had their formal training continue online at respective colleges and universities in terms of current recruitment, we have recently conducted an internal recruitment drive whereby all interviews and in some cases technical assessments were conducted virtually. Our transport strategy team is in the process of externally recruiting as they seek to employ new graduates. This has raised some interesting questions um, with respect to onboarding and we have taken the view that when onboarding external applicants, it's likely that a more physical management presence will be required. Uh, the onus will be on managers of new employees to be in the office with their new recruits initially um, as we want to normalize onboarding as much as we can um, so this will be achieved through desk booking use of meeting rooms uh, and is certainly helped by the opening up of the high street which provides more opportunities for safe working so something that the council has historically been very strong on is the offering of work experience to younger people in full-time education uh, this is actively promoted on our website and we have a two-week program whereby young people are offered opportunities to experience the working world of transport planning, uh, be it in development management, uh, delivery, planning enforcement or a transport strategy and policy context. Um, regrettably, we will find it more difficult to offer the same level of work experience that exposes young people to the cross-cutting world of transport careers. However, this is very much on our radar and we will need to find a way to continue this in some form uh, as the grow your own philosophy is very important to the transport planning divisions within the council. Um, we want to encourage careers in transport as much as we can from a young age and the offer of work experience provides a great introduction to this. Um, on that note, I am aware that a significant proportion of our team is relatively junior and whilst we are a close-knit team, there will inevitably be challenges in terms of maintaining that. Uh, crucially, junior members of the team don't have the same professional network and are losing the conversation uh, that goes on within the office environment. So those times when complex situations are discussed in situ and provide that crucial learning to those within hearing distance. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult to replicate this learning experience 
in a digital world. And we therefore need to maintain the value we have always placed on professional learning and development. Uh, so we need to ensure that team members continue to be given opportunities to shadow meetings and that interesting issues continue to be discussed at wider team meetings. So as a highway authority, it is our view that our structure will need to be maintained as our level of work has not diminished. We do rely on support from external consultants and we don't envisage this changing in light of COVID. Um, I see the council as playing a crucial role in maintaining the skills of the industry as we maintain our statutory function and provide vital support to the economic recovery of the country. Fundamentally, we need to get the balance right in terms of how the council continues to adapt. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks very much, Joe. Joe, can I just ask you one uh, phrase you used in that presentation? I didn't hadn't heard it before. Onboarding. It sounds like uh, some sort of CIA. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, so I just mean the the initial recruitment experience from day one when the new person arrives in the office or in, oh. into their new role. Usually, we have a two week formal onboarding process that would in, uh, incorporate different team members taking responsibilities for di different. Uh, parts of their initial initiation program effectively and okay okay yeah. thanks that's reassured me yeah <laughs> um, thank you um well look um if you anyone's looking at the chat they'll see there's a there's a huge uh, wad of chat has already taken place and i'm still trying to uh, battle to catch up with it we're gonna we're certainly going to come to a lot of the points raised in that um perhaps i can just kick off by um asking about the um just to understand the job losses in the sector and I don't know if anyone wants to come in on this. What I'm trying to grasp is whether the losses are of, is it the most junior people are being shown the door by companies or are we seeing um, a, a kind of more across the board cut reduction? And, and Fred, you, you hinted that actually some of this wasn't really COVID at all, if I've heard you correctly. I mean, um, you were talking about airports. Yeah, I could write a book on, on this. Um, so let's, you asked quite a few different questions there. Different companies have, have taken different approaches. So I won't name any names, but um, certain consultancies have um, basically tried to share the pain. And what I mean by that is that they've uh, decided to cut their overhead or their, their headcount by say five or 6% and expect all divisions within the whole of the business to take their fair share of that hit, which is understandable on the one point, but on the second, when you flip it from that kind of way of thinking, there are divisions within these companies that are fully utilized with a fully utilized team with very good people in them who are being instructed to lose one or two members of those teams to take and share that pain, which is, yeah, as I say, understandable in one regard, commercially uh, suicidal in another, because they're losing skills that are making them money, um, and it's a very sad thing to see. Other um, companies are taking a different view, and it's those uh, divisions that have been hardest hit that are taking the hardest hit. So, for example, if you're heavily involved in development infrastructure and development planning, which has been hit the hardest, it's the quickest to turn off, those people are in the main being the ones that are being let go in certain fields. In other companies that we've seen, um, whereas there has been in certain consultancies no defined uh, level of grade that's been take, taken the hardest hit, there are some companies that have made people redundant in the quickest way possible. And the quickest way possible to do that is to get rid of your grads. And the cheapest way possible is to get rid of your grads rather than the people who've got 20 years experience. And it's the graduates and the apprentices and the people that have been on, uh, on probation who are really easy to put through a redundancy process that we've seen taken the biggest hit, which is a real, real shame to see um, and quite sad. So I think when I, said, when I started my, my presentation, I said that there is no underlying rhyme or no one's up operating in exactly the same way and we are seeing that there is no industry-wide approach to it everyone's taking their own approach so there are quite a lot of companies out there um, and again i won't name names but who haven't made anyone redundant yet there are consultants out there that have pledged that they won't make any redundancies they're clearly the ones that are doing really well 
uh, and haven't had, say, the impact of what, say, Heathrow's had on the likes of um, those consultants that are on that contract. There are other companies that are still honouring the furlough scheme, and I think we are going to see a bit of a problem when that furlough scheme comes to an end in October. But, yeah, different, different people okay. are different, taking different views. Yeah, okay. Um, I can't say, if anyone wants to come in on, on this particular point, then by all means, um, I'm just looking, I, I should have everyone on, on view, actually, which is better, so I can see if anyone's putting their hand up or anything like that. So if you do want to come in on... Um, Andrew, oh, Stephen, yeah. I, I think just to comment with uh, perhaps more with my consultancy hat on than the uh, TPS hat, but um, I, it, it's interesting Fred said that because um, that that might be what he's seeing across the industry. But I think certainly in 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 our firm, um, it, we haven't taken that approach. And I think particularly for um, you know redundancy being about cost saving, cost reduction, um, you know getting rid of the lowest levels doesn't make that much sense. And you know we we've taken a view to retain. Um, retain the sort of apprentices and graduates because they are they are the future of the company so we've had a bit more of a mix of grades um uh, uh that we've uh, we've been looking at for for cost reduction um I, i'm not sure how how other firms have done that but um you know there is a feeling that uh, i think we is a lesson we've learned from previous recessions that um we we need to have uh the, the graduates and apprentices and people coming through for the you know for the for the future years so we've got uh, we've got skills and we've got that cohort coming through the business Okay. Just, just. I mean, I, I, I kind of was reflecting on Tom's point of view that really I can see quite a lot of positive things in, in transport uh, for for the profession. Um, if we if we stand back from COVID for a moment, or even even some of the issues that COVID will throw up. Um, you know, how do you replan your whole bus networks in in cities and uh, anywhere if 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 the funding from government runs out and operators have to reduce services? Local authorities are going to have to look at what services they're going to uh, maintain, and they're going to need presumably consultants to help them advise on on network planning. Um, we've got the the whole um, active travel uh, agenda, which um, I, I can only assume is is being driven by Boris and. And Andrew Gilligan um, with, with with such gusto, um, and uh, the, the the whole carbon agenda. I mean, the carbon agenda. The implications of it, if the policies are followed through, are quite extraordinary for transport, and um, can't be done without a whole lot of staff working on it. So, there seem to be good grounds for for optimism. Uh, Tom, can I, yeah. Um, the other thing around this sort of. Um, desire for and possibly need for change that as i said before i think we as transport planners actually do well or should be very very much involved with the, the other aspect of that is the evidence that needs to support what are going to be difficult decisions so um we've already seen it certainly in uh, in new zealand i'm not sure of examples here in the uk that uh, proper bicycle lanes were taken out Within weeks, when the um, you know, the the car lobby came back with all sort of and, and pretty good arguments, because of course car car usage is pretty high immediately uh, is is already quite high now, but very good argument that all the things that were put in place during lockdown and that we we as transport planners had hoped to be able to retain and protect that these are all that the uh, that these will be taken out unless we have evidence that these are delivering real benefits so it's not just about doing things it's also continuing to make sure that we have got the evidence the data behind the decisions that have been taken and it will continue to have to be taken mm, that's an interesting point and i would think that um Britain on a rainy November day is somewhat different to Australia on any, any day of the year and, and those questions of empty bike lanes might um, be, be raised by one or two people um, relatively soon. Um, yeah, uh, the, the other thought I was just having was the, the financial hit that local authorities are facing and people like Transport for London are facing. That's another area where presumably there's going to have to be a lot of thinking in terms of what um, new revenue streams we have. And we're seeing in London the, the talk of, of, of congestion charging being possibly London wide. So there's another area where um, I would have thought there's, there's a, a oodles of work potentially for, for uh, consultants and transport planners generally. Um, can I go back to the, um, the opening of the chat? And I haven't been able to follow through the, the whole discussion, but I do see a good old friend, a colleague from Leeds University days, years, many years ago, Paul Furman. Paul, I've always wondering where you were, and I see you're at Leeds College of Building now, um, doing the, the courses there. 
can you, um, in a nutshell, perhaps summarize the points you're making in the, in the well, actually the first question's a good one and I'm sure it'll generate some interest from people um, having in the discussion. Are you there, Paul? Hi, everyone. <laughs> Dr. F here. Well, I've got to make you smile on a Friday afternoon, haven't I? Um, yeah, yeah, my perspective is, well, I've been involved in this brand new government trailblazer apprenticeship at the Leeds College of Building, um, getting young people and also sometimes, not so young, but mid-career changers into the transport planning profession as an apprentice. And it's been a real pleasure to be involved in that, I have to tell you, because that's exactly where I started my career years ago myself. So I feel like I'm giving something back to the industry, helping people to have a kickstart in a very interesting career. And I have to report, it's been very sad, my experience, because even though we've now had uh, three or four cohorts of apprentices come through our college um, diploma, course system um, I'm now finding that many of them are either changing career to a more um, definite um, if you like uh, guaranteed income uh, some of them are losing their jobs but want to re remain in the transport planning line having trained in it and got their apprenticeships in it and um, more concerning perhaps is the fact that I'm, I've seen uh, early figures for what we could expect to be enrolling on our course for next term, i.e. starting in September, October. And it's way below what we were expecting, way below. And I think this is to do with obviously the COVID effect causing companies, because it's such, a, such an unknown at the moment, we don't know how long this pandemic is going to go on for, we don't know what the full effects will be in the next two to three months even. Um, they're being very hesitant about taking new staff on and sadly yes uh, some of these young people are the first ones out the door because they were the last ones in and it's not really a uh, particularly uh, enlightening uh, outlook at the moment as far as I can see it's very so sad you're, you're saying on your text that um, we had 43 apprenticeship places for new young transport planners on our diploma course for next year so far post lockdown i've heard that only two places have been confirmed so paul where where does the problem lie is it that the it's it's at the employers is it the, is it the employers or, or are, the, are these apprentices now not working for a company or, or what, what's the issue well the way the apprenticeship is set up is uh, employers are encouraged by the government to take on an apprentice and they will receive part of this apprenticeship levy um, be paid back to them to take on an apprentice. So all these com major companies have to pay into the government levy. Yeah. The only way they can get that money back is to take on an apprentice. That was done to encourage apprenticeships to come into not just transport planning, but a whole host of industries. You know, you could be an, an apprentice hairdresser, you could yeah. be an apprentice dentist, so on. Um, the thing I liked about the transport planning uh, course was we'd never had this before we'd had a really really good track for masters and graduates but we'd never had a track into a transport planning for school leavers mm -hmm. you know when i left school so many years ago i was lucky to go into transport planning because it was a career i wanted to go into but there weren't the facilities there to help me and assist me and yeah. sadly of course this covid effect is really causing a lot of companies to tighten their belts they're okay. not taking on, they're not using this levy that they paid into. They're not taking okay. the apprenticeships, uh, the, so the new apprenticeships the, in. You're thinking that the, the problem lies with the employers, as it were, rather than the apprentices themselves deciding that they're because of COVID or whatever, they're going to have a year out or, or whatever they don't want yeah, to. Yeah, I'm sure there's still a demand for people to come in into the industry. And in, indeed, we've been very proactive with this at the college. We've gone out to schools, we've done careers fairs, we've promoted the uh the, the career line if you like we said look this is available this could be a potential career that you might be interested in doing they then have to seek a, an employer to get that position to then join the apprenticeship but it's uh, understandable isn't it at the moment there's so many unknowns we don't know how long this is going to go on for we don't know when the work's going to come in yeah and they okay. can't take on any new places because of that it's not okay. just apprentices it's, it's graduates as well of course 
Okay, well, look, there's a few strings um, that you've, you've left there. So let's go to Michelle and um, Stephen, can we? Just about the training, um, the, the courses available, the transport planning um, skills and, and, and yeah. accreditation. If, um, yeah, if I, if I can just pick up, I mean, I, th I think the apprenticeship's been great. And our, my, my experience as an employer, um, we've got some really good people through, through Paul's course. Um, who've been great to the to the business. So it, it is worrying to hear that um, those numbers are down. I think I, I think they will pick up, and I think I think people will invest still in in apprenticeships, um, but it might be reduced numbers. You know, as as numbers are reducing across across the industry. But I mean, what what the apprentice just thinking the wider kind of routes to transport plan. I think what the apprenticeships have done is really open that up because you've got the traditional kind of graduate route in and the professional development scheme that we run, um, and that we are making efforts to kind of keep keep going and, and offer to people through all these changes and challenges. Um, we've got the t transport planning professional qualification that people have moved on to um, that has now got chartered status, which is which is much more attractive to people. And of course, we've got the, the, the different level transport, we've got the transport planning technician apprenticeship, and we've got the degree apprenticeship. So there's some really good routes for transport planners to come in. And it's, it'd be really disappointing if they if they do get hit hard by, uh, by, by these changes. And I'm hoping that uh, employers will still in, invest in that. What's what's the what, just before we come to Michelle? What's the what's the message, Stephen, for to, you would say to someone, you know, school leaver or perhaps graduate on on transport planning? I mean, is there a is there a nutshell kind of message that you can you would sell to the subject to people that may be different from uh, six months ago or a year ago? I think I mean I think it's changed over uh, probably over the years that you know transport planning is always part of engineering or, or urban planning and I think transport planning has really evolved with its own identity um, particularly I mean through the I would say this but through the transport planning society which is, was established about 20 years ago we've got Andy Costain on the call who's been been a part of it since the beginning but it's you know I think transport planning has really gained an identity through that we've now got the chartered status for the transport planning professional qualification a lot of big um, organisations are recognising that transport for London transport Scotland, Scotland, Highways England are adopting that as a requirement. So I think transport planning has really got an identity now. And I think you can see with all of the all the major issues facing people, you know, um, uh, climate change, health, um, you know, the pandemic, um, how, how the economy, you know, all of that is related to transport. And I think there's, you know, we can really sell this profession as a really interesting one. There's lo loads of different things you can do within transport planning. So I think it's got a great identity. And I think we do need to do more selling it to, to younger people. But I think it's, you know, it's a really good profession for people to come in into. Okay, over to you, Michelle. Can you come off mute, please? It's all right. Okay. Um, following on from uh, Steve's uh, comments about the TPP uh, qualification, etc., um, there there is quite a lot of demand, especially uh, going. If I could take you back to a um, the CIHT. Uh, Dubai group, well, I did a presentation about a month ago, and we had, um, from there, we had three people who are really keen, so we are mentoring them uh, on it. Um, they, they are working in the profession. So uh, following on from the, through the apprentice route, um, PTRC, we have been approached by uh, HS2 um, about two years ago to put three of their apprentices on to supplement the uh, training, the course run by uh, the uh, Leeds College of Building. So it's um, the one on data uh, collection, one on uh, planning application, uh, and, uh, what, and uh, one on modeling. Uh, so we supplement it by putting together courses for the apprentices. Uh, and then we were going to pull together uh, work training within the companies that are involved in the training. Uh, so the, the companies uh, involved are major consultancies and they're really keen to do that. But I think, uh, I haven't followed through what happened, but I believe uh, they, they may have put it on hold, but um, the training program has gone on but not sure about the uh, work experience training. But um, we, we've been asked to pull that together and um, the, 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 graduate, the apprentices are really, really keen on that. And it follows the format that we normally run uh, as part of our one day and two day uh, courses for 
people, transport planners in the industry. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, we might come back to some of those points. Um, Fred, can I come back to you? Um, it looks like you're writing an email, but maybe you, you, you can hear, you can hear. Okay. Um, yeah, Fred, you were, um, I think when COVID started, actually, you, you took out, I think I'm correct in saying that your company took out a, a front page advert on LTT for opportunities to work abroad. I think it was new. It was a lovely picture of New Zealand. Um, and I had um, almost a heart attack when I heard that this was uh, going to be uh, the, the new layout of LTT. <laughs> but it really does actually look terrific. Um, but they, they, we haven't had any more, unfortunately, regrettably. Um, but uh, it did strike me that this is a COVID is a global issue. Um, and maybe in past recessions, which were perhaps just UK or Europe, or whatever, there was always an opportunity for people who couldn't get work in the UK to, to go abroad. To, to find work at these kind of lean times. Is, is, that, is that true of this occasion or, or not? Um, as we entered the pandemic, um, so in March, um, and when that advert went live, New Zealand's borders were still open. Uh, and then towards the end of March or middle of April, those borders got shut. Um, to the point whereby there was absolutely no way we could get anyone over those borders. Um, and so in 2009, when we were working with in the recession, the Middle East certainly and Australia would take quite a large amount of people out of the UK and they were eminently employable over there. That's not the case right now. So we, we wouldn't be able to necessarily um, place people in those markets. But what we can do is see how those markets are reacting because they are further than us in regards to how they've coped with the pandemic. So New Zealand, as a kind of microcosm of our industry, is actually doing really quite well. And there is requirement over there, and they have put funding into the system, and there is money flowing, and therefore there is this, there's going to be a real need for skills, and the skills that they simply don't exist in New Zealand. They are tied by the border control and the fact that we can't get people over. We can't even get people from Australia into New Zealand at the moment. We're still talking about the average. It's funny how we have this issue with the fact that we've got potential quarantine issues coming back from Spain. Over in Australia and New Zealand, this wouldn't even be a thought. They haven't got any ability to fly between the two countries at all. Um, and perhaps we need to kind of take a look at that, but that's a, another political issue. Mm. I think one of the interesting things that's been raised out of this whole... Um, conversation so far is that uh, you just pointed to it there is that advertising um, and being work, working in transport planning recruitment for 20 years what we can definitely say is that the private sector is amazing at marketing itself and amazing at getting the word out as to the skills and requirements that it needs the public sector is the exact opposite the public sector is absolutely terrible at marketing itself. I think that Oxford's doing a really good job at the moment and they are kind of pushing boundaries of what they can show a public sector organisation to be. But they do not have the same budget, I imagine, or the same uh, kind of ideas as to how to market themselves as a employer of choice. Or do they have the ability to push out the adverts or the vacancies that they need? I think that there might be a call for a bit of a step change and this is possibly the best way we can retain skills in that if for example um, Transport for the West Midlands put out a, a tender recently for two active travel uh, coordinators. Now it's probably the case that that contract will have been won by um, say Atkins or whoever and they will second it in to their people. But what they could do is probably save quite a lot of money by actually approaching the market of those people who are now on the market because of what's happened and bring these people in, like what Joe was saying, on a, a contract basis to support them. While there are these projects and programs there and while there are people on the market, they don't necessarily need to go through some kind of tender response or tender release to the private sector to fill these programs that are definitely there. They can probably by being advised on how to do so most effectively, go and reach out to that audience. Because we do have, through the TPS now and the CIHT, a real community. And I think that we need to be able to get 
this message across to that community in a much more effective way. And I think the public sector could probably learn a lot from the private sector as to how they've done that over the past 20 years. Okay, good. Um, I'm sorry if I'm a little bit late in trying to get through in, in reading some of these chats. Andy Castain, you emailed me. Um, you wanted to say something about master's courses. Can you come off? You're on mute, I think. Yeah, so I'm the business manager of TPS and I'm also responsible for our recruitment um, site on the TPS website. So I've got a bit of um, sort of feedback from there. Um, and TPS also conducts and has done for many years an annual survey of all the master's courses in the UK. And I just want to raise that as a particular concern because obviously um, doing a master's course is a route into the profession and we've seen in the past that if there is a, a downturn in the number of people doing master's courses that has a knock-on effect in years to come for the profession. Now last year when we did our survey the main um, key points that came out of that was the number of um, UK participants on, on master's courses was well down, Europe was well down, and the only part of the redeeming situation was the rest of the world. And I know from talking to the universities that they are expecting an extremely bleak time because they expect the UK to, to diminish further. Brexit is a dumb, double whammy, so that will be down and the rest of the world on which they rely for you know, fees and income is going to be seriously impacted. So I think that that is uh, something that hasn't been mentioned that I would just like to raise. Now on the question, my second point is about sort of recruitment at the moment. And the anecdotal um, experience that I've got is talking to firms, and Fred might have a different view on this, is there are still plenty of jobs around in specialist areas, but the blockage at the moment for advertising them has been that HR and recruitment departments have not been fully operational, everybody working at home and with other priorities. So um, there is a feeling that as soon as organizations are managed to sort of streamline their their operations that more vacancies might actually be may be placed thank you well, those, those are very interesting points andy i mean the, the, the your first one on the university sounds quite potentially quite worrying for the survival of courses i mean maybe i'm extrapolating too far there but um it seems to be that all three of the main audiences um for courses are, are in decline yeah, I think the only hope, and I've had discussions with some of the universities about how TPS could actually help promote their courses as a, as a group rather than individually, which we already do. And unpicking our statistics, a lot of the participants on the courses are part-timers sponsored by their, by their companies. So I think one of the messages, if we can get it out there, is that um, organizations in the UK should not stop funding their part-timers to do these courses. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, was, I was actually wondering if the B word would come up today, and it has. Um, we've heard about Brexit. Uh, and I, I wondered whether Brexit had actually perhaps helped the market for UK transport people um, because other people have decided they don't want to come to Britain anymore or they want to move away from Britain. Um, have we got anyone who wants to offer any insights on that? Um, I, I can. <laughs> yeah, no, Fred, back to you, Fred. Come on. Yeah. Interesting to hear. Um, we have, uh, so we used to do quite a lot of recruitment from the EU into the UK. Um, this year, that's continued actually. Before the pandemic, we were still bringing people in from Italy and Spain um, into companies over here. That tap will turn off. Uh, we're not going to be able to do that um, going into next year. Um, we are going through a process at the moment with one of our public sector clients where they're 
sponsoring uh, or, go, or hoping to sponsor um, a tier two visa. And so what we expect to happen actually is that, yeah, the, the, the tap from the EU coming into the UK will turn off and it's, it's not going to be free movement and we all know that. But what it might do is actually open up opportunities to the rest of the world, um, but it's going to come at a cost. And it's not cheap uh, and it's not free to go through a tier two visa sponsorship program. It costs companies money. And so that the time, the effort and, and the expense of doing so means that in a climate where people are already tightening their belts, they're going to first and foremost certainly look to the UK market. It can be a very rare thing for them to go to um, outside of the UK market until the market itself really ramps up. And, and you know, we don't know when that's going to be. Okay. We, have say, we haven't seen that many people decide that they were going to leave our shores because of Brexit. I have heard of one or two, but, you know, very small numbers who have just had enough, uh, I think, you know, and they have decided to, take to fly. Uh, but I don't think that there's many of them. Okay. Just, oh, yeah, Stephen. Yeah, I, do, I think I just want to add to that. I think I think I'm a bit I'm a bit negative about about the impacts of Brexit just on on staff opportunities as, as Fred's outlined. And I think you know we we really need diversity in transport planning. Anything that kind of stops us being able to get different people from different backgrounds and experience into the business. You know, we've got a lot of um, staff at Arup who come from the EU, and you just get a different. You know, they've they've had different experiences educationally. They've got different work experience, and you know, you just there's potential to lose some of that diversity. But I think on the perhaps on the positive side, maybe uh, Tom mentioned earlier that you know any change is an opportunity. You know we do deal a lot in change. That actually, you know Brexit itself is going to bring about a lot of change in how things work and how transport works, um, and that that may create some opportunities for UK transport planners. So there may may be a bit of optimism for that. Okay, just going through the chat, I see Joe um, at uh, Buckinghamshire. You you've um, must point this out to Paul Furman, who's um, I'm sure still there. Um, She's highly recommending your uh, your course, jo um, Paul. Oh, oh yeah, thumbs absolutely. up, <laughs> thumbs up from Paul there. Um, two excellent apprentices, um, which she has. Um, Car Caroline, can I bring in Caroline? Um, I'm afraid I don't know the meaning of the initials, but you're saying interesting things about apprentices. Hi, Caroline. Can you? Oh, you're on mute. That's yeah, you're a little bit faint, but I don't know why that is. Okay. Does help if I put the microphone down, doesn't it? <laughs> no, I, was, I, I was listening. Yeah, sorry, apprenticeships. Um, yeah, I think there's two issues around apprenticeships. Firstly, there are apprentices already on program, and there are two forms of apprenticeships. One at level three, which is for technically for 16 year olds coming out of school with very little experience and going into this career, this career for the first time. The second one is the degree apprenticeship route, which is more for people who have already got things like A-levels, who are overqualified to do the level three. And they will be going on a perhaps a four to five year journey to become a transport planning professional, um, sort of a little bit after the degree apprenticeship. Um, so there are two different routes into the industry. We have an issue here. We've got, well, we've got two issues. We've got the first one, which is we've already got people on program. What's happening to them? Are they being furloughed? Are they, oh, are they being made redundant? And how do we retain those people in the workforce already? And the second one is a complete freeze on brand new recruits. And it was talked about before the onboarding. The difficulty with recruiting brand new talent into the sector is they've never worked They've never worked before, potentially. So bringing them in, onboarding them, inducting them, sending them, we can't, can't really send them away to do a course at the moment. Um, and that's been the biggest problem for attracting new talent this year. But I think that's a very short term view. I think when we talk about it, we do need to change all of the programmes that we've ever developed, start in September, start in October. We need to think about the way we deliver skills going forward and why is it such a rigid start in September, start in October model that we've got in the UK. I think we need to begin to be more flexible with recruitment, um, look at the upskilling opportunities for existing staff for this particular year. But obviously the bigger pot for me is how do we retain those people that are already part way through their apprenticeship programme and if people are being made redundant there is opportunities in local authorities sell it sell those opportunities to them and keep them in the in the sector 
-hmm. we need to do something about okay to not lose that talent okay thank you um I'm, I'm getting lost in discussions here on the on the chat just to, just when we're um, ringing up there peter stonham you want to make a point yeah i, I thought there was one area that's been touched on but might be developed further I, I think it was raised by um tom and it's also been raised by paul um and i go right back to the beginning of transport planning society to stephen um a few years ahead of andy on that um when we set it up I think there was a clear new professional area needed to be defined, which was in the shadow of, of normal town planning and engineering, etc. And uh, at the time, it looked like something you could quite clearly define. Um, I think that's not the case at all now. Um, there's been comments made about the demand for people with the right skills. And the right skills are completely different now. If we take decarbonisation, climate change, healthy lifestyles. I, mean, I wouldn't start with the word transport at all. Um, if you had an appointment in a local authority for someone to get people to live more sustainable lives and healthier lives, you wouldn't start with the word transport planning. You'd start with the word, um, you know, sustainable lifestyle officer or something. Um, I think we're getting stuck in a bit of a rut here in this conversation because everybody's trying to keep afloat the old boat and maybe there needs to be a new one. Mm -hmm. Andrew, can I yeah. can I respond to that? Because I I think um, I, I disagree. I think I think transport planning will always be there. I think we just need to evolve the definition, and I think we have been doing that. The um, we've revised, did a big review of the professional development scheme to update it. Um, Glenn, Professor Glenn Lyons uh, looked at that, and that will be launched um, I think next month. Um, so we are updating it. I, th I think it's just about evolving the definition. And I, I talked a bit at the beginning about some of the skills I think are needed in future. And it's not to say none of the traditional skills in transport planning won't be needed, but I think it is evolving. Um, and that's where I think that's where I do agree with Peter that um, things are changing. Um, data analytics, and I think Tom Tom has talked about that as well. That you know to measure and assess the changes we're seeing um, to provide evidence-based new forms of, of transport modelling, uh, activity-based modelling, particularly um, carbon assessment. Peter mentioned, and I think you know really transport planners really need to start to get their heads around carbon budgets, how that relates to local areas. There's a really interesting report from Transport for Quality of Life recently in the last few weeks about the um, impact of the uh, roads program on carbon. And it was saying that you know we really need to understand local uh, carbon budgets and something transplant has really got to get to grips with we need to engage with local communities we need to collaborate with other other sectors um, and particularly link with spatial planning um, you know we're gonna have to there'll be a lot of reconfiguring of urban areas i think as a result of the pandemic it could be quite a lot of changes to office space the way people work the way people carry activities locally um, so I think yeah, there's going to be a lot of changes. So I, I agree, transport planning, the definition of it needs to evolve, but I think transport planning will always be there. It's just becoming different, different things and different skills. And I think people do need to look at how they can develop their skills to keep up with that. Are the um, people in the profession at the moment the right people, Stephen? That's a good question. Um, I, th I think I think so. I'm going to answer that, go Steve. On, because answer I, that I think we have got very clever people, uh, and uh, I think people in transport planning have been waiting for the opportunity to to get. I think I maybe I say I'm an optimist here to get the recognition that we now see of the role, not just the role of transport in society, but also that it's not about transport. It's about people being able to lead their lives and be healthy and be uh, be successful and 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 um, have access to uh, whatever they need, which no longer should be about just the movement of people. It's about transport planning becoming a a way in which we can enable urban life to you know, to be to be easy and successful. And I'm I'm not necessarily saying we need to to change our our, our job title, but that is what we need to sell to people. So. It's, it's an extremely exciting time to sort of be recognized for what we as transport planners either are doing or what we should be doing. Right. Is that a good answer, Stephen? Does he, is he said what you were going to say? 
Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I agree. That is, he's right. And that's a great positive view of it. And I think we need to get that out there to younger people just be saying, you know, get into apprenticeships, get onto master's mm -hmm. courses, because by the time you're through that, you know, things will be booming again. And I think for existing people in the industry, I, I think, Tom, that is an important point that people need to be flexible and adaptable. You can't just keep doing the same thing, keep doing what you've always been doing. Mm -hmm. And that's something our training programs try to reinforce is that, you know, you need to develop different skills and broaden your skills. But I think transplanters will need to be flexible, adaptable, resilient as we go forward. Uh -huh. Okay. Going back to Peter, is that satisfied? Is Peter, you're still there. What do you, what do you think of those comments? Um, I think that's right for today in the middle of this difficult situation, but I think we should be planning ahead of, with a more visionary approach to the sort of skill sets that are going to be needed. Um, I, I'm sorry, Stephen, I do disagree with you. I, I think you're protecting your silo. Um, and I've seen that happen across all sorts of professions during my working life. And people tend to want to protect the silo they built for themselves. And as the world changes, you sometimes need to make a new landscape for the skills and the things that society needs. Mm. Do we need a new society, Peter? Uh, I probably don't think so, because that's just a silo, isn't it? <laughs> I, well, I thought maybe a more overarching, kind of far-reaching, visionary urban I, I think we need a discussion which is not constrained by where people are sitting now that, and i i welcome what you said tom i think you're having it and, and there are people having it but i think it's too easy for people in professions to start rewriting the world around them rather than the other way around okay well, I, I think that there's a can I just come back on that because I think there is a you know transplant has got a great sort of heritage and I think we're building a really good identity for it I totally agree that it needs to evolve and it is about people and we need to be adaptable but I think you know you can't throw away what's already there and I think we need to we just need to evolve it to reflect uh, how society is changing but I think you can do that under a transport planning banner but we just need to be flexible and adaptable yeah yeah I, I, I like to uh to com uh, agree with um, both Tom and um, Steve because it's very important. I, it, we've fought long and hard to get transport planners recognized as a profession and it took I would say like 15, 16, 17 years because it took about five to six years to plan and work it all around and finally it was launched in, uh, is it 2008? About 12 years ago and um, we've, as um, Steve said, um, we've updated um, uh, the competence unit and all the requirements for them uh, in incorporating uncertainties and making sure that transport planners are actually wider than our discipline because there is no one um, degree that the uh, transport planners come in from because I come in from an economics background and I know a lot of my colleagues come from geography, philosophy, uh, aerodynamics, I mean, you name it, it, it come from, it, and because it's such a wide discipline they're coming through, um, they're able to pull together really fantastic uh, ideas and characteristics. Um, and it, the, um, and I think Steve, you said the, um, the new uh, TPP competence unit is coming out next month, that should be reflected. Yeah, that's uh, right. Re reflecting all these thoughts that's gone through because um, about 18 months ago Grand Lions put, uh, was chairing all this um, review uh, we took which took about three months I think and it gone through uh, the local authorities gone through the uh, reviewers TPP reviewers to the candidates uh, to consultancies so you name it everybody's been consulted and the major message is that it needs to incorporate new thinking moving forward because it's slightly inflexible uh, so the one of the units especially that we've when it started is called trans travel planning and that is going to be totally changed because as well as being able to launch overseas we uh, nobody overseas know what travel planning is so but travel planning is a subset of travel demand management Okay, so this is coming out. This is coming out next month. Yeah, please, it, it, please, it it has been delayed. LTC receives good notification of that because we'll we'll give it good coverage. We um, will, and Andy can note that. Yeah, yeah. please. 
Um, just there's, there's so many interesting things. I've never known a, um, a, 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 a Zoom chat where we've had so much chat on the, on the side going down. Um, and there's, there's lots of interesting points there. I mean, Joe Thornton, you were making a point about uh, people applying for jobs you're getting. Do you want to just explain what you, were gonna, what you said? Uh, yeah, it's been quite interesting. We're, we've been recruiting externally recently for some mid to senior level posts, which, you know, would be not notoriously difficult historically. Um, but we found that we've had at least a couple of applications from people, you know, that we were uh, far too qualified, you know, looking to come to Bucks as a result so that they're currently contracting and just want and, and are nervous about the whole situation. Uh, situation and job security and what have you and want the um, security of the public sector income to support their private sector work. And are you put off from re recruiting these people because of their level of qualification? No, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for the council. You know, we have someone on our team that does exactly that and it's brilliant. They're, you know, a real asset that we're lucky to have. Okay, good. And Paul, Paul, Fer oh, oh, yeah, Stephen, yeah. Sorry, Andrew, I just want to come in on that because something Michelle said uh, right at the beginning about um, more people on sort of contract work and the people working remotely. And from what Joe was just saying, it's kind of really got me thinking. And uh, maybe this is where Peter's right. We need to think about how work might change in the future and how our role might change. But it does, I've, I've thought there was already a bit of a move to kind of more. Uh, contractors, more independent consultants, people who were, you know, we found we use in, in the business in London, people who were living in, you know, the Lake District or the West Country would, um, you know, who've been in the industry for a while and then gone to sort of contractor status, coming in, doing a couple of days in London in the office, working remotely the rest of the time. I can only see that increasing after the pandemic. So I just wonder if there might be quite a change in the way we work if, if businesses want less office space, they have maybe a core team, but there's much more reliance on contractors, people moving around, perhaps doing two or three different jobs, and whether that fits in with what, what sort of Joe was just saying. I think Fred, Fred's waving his arm. Fred, yeah. um, I think that you're right, Stephen, um, that, that, is, that there is potentially going to be much more um, demand from the public and the private sector for contract support because they don't have the certainty as to whether the funding or the programs are going to continue. So contract support can help them in a very short term way without exposing them to the risks of bringing someone in on a permanent um, contract. The flip side to that is that it's relatively easy for you, uh, Arab, to bring in an independent consultant, not so easy in the public sector with regards to IR35. So the IR35 issue um, is going to impact you now next April because it was put back a year. But in the public sector, that's obviously a concern. So, so they need to ensure that if you say, let's say a permanent um, member of your staff is made redundant and then is considering contracts, they need to be aware and they need the, not the, the training, but they need to have someone who they can talk to about the implications of going contracts. It's not just straightforward. It's not like going from one perm job to the next. It's a whole different way of life. And there are different laws and different ways of being paid. So as long as the industry is aware of that, and there are people there to advise, I mean, I can advise, there's lots of other people in my industry that can advise on this, um, then yeah, absolutely. Uh, but the, the thing that we need to be aware of, and I think that also going back to Joe's point, is that the, in the main, most people would prefer and would err towards a permanent job. They would be much more secure in a permanent role. And this, I would see, is a, um, a, a temporary, I mean, kind of part of the pun, but a temporary way of maintaining the skills of the industry by putting them into a contract the issue that they you'll have is that as soon as they get a permanent job they'll be off they will they will go for that role and i think the issue that joe needs to be aware of in the, in the public sector and, and everyone else is that you might have someone who is overqualified for a role and they've taken a job because there isn't much else out there at the moment but if they did see a role that was ten thousand pound more a year because it is more in line with the level of experience that they've got you might be at risk of losing that skill. So as we come through this and as things start to get better, yeah, excellent to have that person in now and they could bring so much to, to the team, but it might be, there might be a flight risk. And that's something that you see uh, in my world quite a bit. So it's just something to be aware of. Okay, yeah. 
What about the, the whole issue of um, more home working um, in the sector? Uh, I mean, it, it, what's people's experience of, of, of delivering projects? And I, I, I'm looking at local authorities or consultants, whatever here. Um, has it thrown up problems? Is it likely to be remain a, a, a more um, more home working that you're going to have? Uh, cer certainly, in the at the council, I think we'll have far more home working than we've ever had. I think that's a given now because it's working. You know, we're running our service entirely. Um, you know, we're holding planning committees. You know, we're doing everything virtually and and succeeding. So, in that sense, for the, the public sector, I certainly think that will continue. Right. Yeah. And Andrew, can I jump in there as a modeler? I think that's, you know, this is absolutely fascinating stuff, isn't it? Because these are not just transport impacts that perhaps we immediately are thinking of. These are urban structure impacts. These are lifestyle impacts. These are lifestyle choices impacts that we all need to start considering as transport planners when building pictures of the future, the need for intervention, the value of, of infrastructure. Um, the loss of city centre jobs that are supporting city centre workers, for example, I don't think yeah, the, 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 it's, enor it's enormously complicated. And um, I think, can't remember who it was, uh, somebody said, look, let's look at a New Zealand or, uh, or Australia, which is a bit further ahead in this than we are, and see how people really are responding. Because we are living in a little bit of a bubble of um, people that can work from home and people that um, doing jobs that that potentially have a lot of meetings that, that can be done better via Zoom or, or Teams or whatever else. Um, so I think I would say there are two sides of it to me. One is let's not ignore the complexity of, of what, the, what would happen if we continue to work from home. The other thing is how real is it? And, um, and, and what does that mean for, for us as, as a profession in terms of what we would need to do? Um, to to support that. Mm. Do you have any concerns about staff not feeling part of the organisation, not getting the culture, particularly young staff, um, not feeling part of it? Well, I think I think uh, uh, that's probably a one one that will yeah that we will only find out about. I think I think this this just like like so many other things requires a different approach. I think Joe was talking about onboarding and it's it's a different approach to 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 uh, ensuring that people have got uh, that um, that attachment to an organization that feeling that they are part of a team, the ability to learn um, and and some of these things are being done quite well and and I think we've we've made enormous strides in, in, in doing that well. For example, a meeting such as this, th even three months ago, would have been a nightmare in terms of connectivity and backgrounds and uh, people being on mute and what have you got. So I think, I think there, are, there are ways in which we can deal with that. How, my, my, my point, how, how real is this for the whole of, um, of, a, of an urban society? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can, can I come in on that? Yeah. Um, okay, for, um, we, we have, we have uh, a member of staff put on furlough since March and um, she's being brought back in uh, next week for three, three days in the week. Uh, this is to support our um, transport planning for, uh, practitioners meeting conference, which is happening beginning of September and we had to get her in uh, to so that we can get the work uh, and all the programs, everything built in, uh, it's going to be delivered online. So we're going to be supporting her. There's at least myself and my colleague will be supporting her full time because she's not been in work for like the whole four months. So for her to come back in, she needs a lot of hand holding. Uh, and so we've put together like management plan and task list and with time scales and who's going to be looking after her. So I think very much so when people are coming back in, they need that support uh, to take them forward because she basically told me she's not been out of her house since the lockdown. 
uh, saying she's been put on furlough. So she's not done any computing work. So I'm thinking, oh my God. So <laughs> is she yeah. going to be rusty typing? Yeah. So you're going to need to take care of these people. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're, 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 um, I've just, th th there's one item which hasn't really been mentioned and I guess it's, uh, um, it's, uh, it wasn't core, but it kind of flows on from what we discussed. So I'm going to go back to Peter. I can either read it out, Peter, or, or ask the, or you can read your, your point about, uh, mindsets in the next generation. Come on. It's an interesting point you raised. Well, I, I was just trying to back up what I said um, and um, got knocked back by Stephen and sometimes, Stephen, we must have a pint over this. Um, look, the next generation want the world to be very different. They're, not everyone, of course, but there's a generation Zoom, I think it's called now. And, and they'll look at this profession and they'll say, oh, transport planning, that sounds interesting. What does it do? And they said, oh, well, it designs roads and it, and it plans airports. Uh, but it wants to be really sustainable. And look, there's a heritage problem with this sector now. There's some good stuff in transport planning which suits the new world, and there's some old stuff in transport planning that doesn't. I'm sorry, Stephen, your company makes half its money out of the old stuff. Right. Well, we always keep these good-natured conversations, so there's no, uh, no personal uh, targeting here. It's just any... Uh, just just a, a, the general point about um, the, uh, the the profession has a lot of kind of carbon hungry transport investments and I think the point Peter's making is that a lot of young people coming through might kind of frown upon that and uh, class class us all in the kind of fossil fuel lobby bad people Andrew can I just can I just come in because I think I think Peter, you know Peter's right he's got he's got a really good point and I think we have you know there is a there is a history of you know, transport planners working, yeah, building roads, building airports and contributing to a lot of the problems we already have. You know, some the, the, the highway design we have in most places in the UK is pretty challenging and we're trying to undo a lot of that now. But I think the industry is evolving. And I think as long as transport planning is now seen that, you know, we, we've we've learned lessons of those ways. That's not, not all it's been by transport planners, but we some of it has been. And we, you know, we can see some of the issues that's caused. Um, and, you know, a lot of private public sector uh, organizations are doing a lot to change that and to be, you know, I think it, it is an attractive profession for those XR campaigners that he mentions because, um, you know, you can make quite a difference here. You can, you know, be involved in active travel, sustainable transport and changing some of the ways that, you know, travel happens and reducing its impact. So I think, I think you know, it's right that we need to change, but, um, you know, that can be done within transport planning and transport planners. We, but it is a, it's an impress and it's an idea an image uh, issue that uh, we need to update it and make sure that we're seen to be part of the solution, not the problem. Mm. Maybe the courts will solve the problem because there's court cases flying left, right and centre on this to try and prevent us building anything new. So uh, the problem may be taken our, out of our hands. Um, Jonathan Spear. Jonathan, you're just making an interesting point about how we're part of the solution. Uh, well, by bringing everyone together um, from multiple well, you, you places. You just told me that you've been in Australia, mm -hmm. the United States and the UK today. Yes, all, all from my living room in Dubai. Um, so basically, I could, I, could be in, I could be in four places in one day without going anywhere, um, which, is, which is amazing. And that, that was the point I was, I was making on the chat earlier. And I think this is where... Um, as transport planners, we really need to uh, get our heads around, and, and, and you know, Glenn, Glenn Lyons has done a lot of work on this on kind of triple accessibility, um, where you have kind of spatial proximity, which effectively is land use planning. You have physical mobility, which effectively is transport planning. And then you have digital connectivity, which is um, ICT and uh, virtual interactions. And... I think a lot of the um, problems that we have with the transport system are also from physical mobility, moving people from A to B, and actually many of the issues will, will be addressed or resolved if we can do things in a more virtual way. And COVID-19, one, one of the big kind of positives, I think, of the whole pandemic is the way that we've been able to keep companies running, projects going, serving our clients um, by 
basically falling back on Teams and Zoom uh, and, and, and using technology. Um, and that goes for the international space as well. Where, and, and, and the point I was making last was, uh, whilst we may continue international consultancy, although of course that's maybe has a question mark over it, because I think we're moving back from globalization, but nevertheless, international consultancy will, will continue, but we won't be able to fly in and fly out as much anymore because uh, of climate change uh, and how that's going to hit the aviation sector. So I think there's, there's a whole area of debate there that COVID's raised uh, around kind of virtual working and how we plan it in the future uh, and how it interacts with kind of physical mobility that, uh, you know, we're, we're only at the start of the journey now, I think. Um, but, you know, clearly as we come out of the pandemic and companies and individuals continue to work to some extent online, the question is how much do they do that? Um, what are going to be the, the implications for the way that companies work, organisations are structured, um, but also what are the implications for the transport system? And there's going to be some positives and negatives around that. Okay, okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, thanks for that. And um, maybe, I think we, we always try and finish these about 3.30, we feel that's an appropriate kind of time. Um, can I maybe just... Rather than me kind of summing up, I, mean, I, I would say that I've learned a lot in this and um, I think the, the, the conversation's been excellent. It's been, it's been a real privilege to listen to people with such interesting perspectives and so closely involved um, in the decisions and, and uh, which will shape what, what does happen with the profession. Um, but I wonder whether, Fred, you kind of kicked this whole idea of having this discussion off, if I'm, if I'm right in thinking. I wonder whether you've got any reflections, just you know, full, a couple of bullet points or whatever to make on, on what you've heard today that, that stand out. Yeah, there's, um, there's, there's two definite different um, things being discussed on this discussion. One is uh, apprenticeships, training, qualifications, um, and also similar to that, the, the, the way in which the planning profession, the transport planning profession is viewed by the youth of today. Um, that's always been a problem, hasn't it? I think that's always been an issue that we've always had to tackle. The second issue, the second thing that I'm going to take away from this is um, what we do as an action point to make sure that those people who are being made redundant or will be made redundant once further comes to a close, what we're going to do to be able to keep them um, occupied uh, for the period of time whilst the market um, returns. Uh, so there's two different things happening, there's two different lines of communication, conversation happening, both of which are equally as important. Um, and I think I, I, what, what is not, I think it's more obvious to me as a recruiter as to how we keep those people busy that lose their jobs, because I think that the work is there within the public sector. What's not so obvious to me is how, um, especially given that it's so difficult to onboard people, as, uh, as people have said, is to how we keep the courses at the universities, the courses in the college and these apprenticeships moving. I just can't, I can't, it, maybe I need to sleep on it. I can't work out how we're going to keep that moving uh, in the current climate. There's just not enough of that graduate intake um, happening at, at that level uh, from what I can see. And, that, and I think that's a real problem. Okay, well, thank you. And um, I'm going to hand back to now to Peter just with a thank you to all the participants and uh, the presentations. Excellent. Thank you. Hi, Andrew. Uh, thanks a lot. Brilliant discussion. Brilliant hosting. Well done, Andrew. Um, wonderful panellists. Thank you all. Um, we've gone on for longer than I think I remember in recent uh, discussions. It's been uh, absolutely intense in some ways but hugely revelatory to me and prompted obviously thoughts which one of which i contributed about how all this plan pans out going forward um there is a smaller group of people in the profession interested in discussions like this because a lot of people just get on with their jobs and they don't want to be thinking about the philosophy of the profession or the future planning of its talent you know? but i think it is an important discussion and I, um, I don't know how, but I'd like to put a marker down for a, for a follow-up on this in some way, partly through our print products and our digital uh, output, but also in terms of further 
online forums like this, which can raise all sorts of issues um, uh, over and above those which get communicated in print or in, um, in structured uh, email or, uh, or documents. So um, thanks everyone for coming, been excellent. We're taking a break from these um, online discussions for at least for the month of August. Uh, and hopefully we'll be back uh, in September with some more good stuff to join in discussions in uh, every other Friday. Thanks a lot, everyone.